Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Roberta Matthewson, who is in Boston. How are you doing, Roberta? I'm great. Thank you. Excellent. And for more than 25 years, Robert has been helping organizations find, hire, and keep top talent. Uh, and what we were going to talk about today is that subject about finding and retaining uh, top talent. Uh, Roberta, it's always, been, you know, finding and retaining top talent has always been a challenge, right? But it just, it just seems like it's an even greater challenge now because people have so many options about how they want to work, where they want to work, what kind of setup they want to be in, um, all of that. You know, whether they want to be contractors, whether they want to be full-time employees, there are so many different uh, different factors at play than ever before. So it's probably not surprising that a lot of uh, hiring managers are, are and companies are, are feeling a little bit kind of lost in all of this. <laughs> I think lost is a really good way to capture how people are feeling these days. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, false information out there and that people are buying these lines like nobody wants to work anymore, which couldn't be further than the truth. Uh, the real truth is they just don't want to work for you. Right. And so there are ways for us to get around that, and that is to really become an employer of choice and and to be a place where people are lining up outside the door just to come work for us. Yeah, because let's face it, I mean, there's a lot of great excuses around now. You can use the, you know, the great resignation, you know, the uh, the post-pandemic hangover, whatever, whatever <laughs> you like to call it. Um, but people are still looking for opportunity, to your point, I mean, they may not be looking to work for you, but they're looking to work for for somebody. So, how do you how do you as an organization start to address this? Start to make yourself more attractive. Well, the first thing you have to do is find out what makes you attractive. And to be honest with you, looking in the mirror and saying, "Oh, I'm pretty attractive," doesn't really cut it. And so, there are a couple of ways you can do that. And this is what I do with my consulting clients and. And the first way is to sit down with people in your organization and ask them, hey, why did you decide to come work here? And are the reasons that you made that decision still valid? And so then you'll start to see some patterns, like why are people attracted to us? What is it that that group of people is looking for? And then you'll know where to put your money, right? And then the second piece is to make sure you do what I call stay interviews. And that's where, you know, you come in and you ask people, uh, you know, what were your hopes and dreams when you took this job? And what, if anything, has changed? And how can I be of help? And the second, you know, the that sector, that hopes and dreams conversation, that really needs to happen with an outside party because people are going to be really hesitant to tell you the truth. Yeah, no, I can imagine that, especially if you're saying like, well, my ambition is to have your job, actually. Um, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't always go down that well. Uh, but it's a, but it's a good point here in the fact that it, part of it is just reaching out and having those conversations, because I think I don't know whether you agree with this or not, Roberta, but I mean, I feel like pre-pandemic, people were already starting to sort of feel like they were being a little bit dehumanized in the workplace. Uh, mm -hmm. And then with the pandemic, you know, people got a heightened sense, of, heightened sense of needing connection. So here we're on the other side of it now. I think that whole understanding people, talking to them, I think people want to be seen, don't they? They want to be seen and heard and understood. Yes. What's really interesting is I wrote the book Evergreen Talent, um, before the pandemic. And the book mm -hmm. came out in February of 2020. And then we were really into the pandemic full force in March. So mm -hmm. you can imagine, right? <laughs> Not great right, to right. the book, but it was interesting to me because I just sort of said, okay, not great timing, go write another book, which I did. But I came back to this book, Evergreen Talent, when I saw what was going on in organizations post-pandemic, uh, I actually 
reread my own book and I thought, man, this is still very much valid. So, you know, the tips that I offer in this book are very um, useful in this post pandemic environment. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just, uh, and we will have the book below, but uh, the book is Evergreen Talent, A Guide to Hiring and Cultivating a Sustainable uh, Workforce. Um, so why, uh, as you said, when you came out of this, this is even more important than ever. Can you, can, can you just give me a, 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 an insight into the genesis of the book, why you wrote the book and why you think it's even more important now? Well, I wrote the book because I, I, I was sick and tired of answering the same questions over and over again, right? From my, you know, from prospects or when I did speeches. I mean, I could see there was this huge demand for what I call evergreen talent, and that's talent mm. that stays green forever in your organization. It's not talent that, you know, dies on the vine, right? And then you have to start, you know, clear cutting and getting rid of all this uh, debris. So... After, you know, the pandemic, the biggest challenge has been that a lot of people have not come back, right? right. And um, interesting story, I was just at the dentist today, and uh, this was a specialist, I hadn't seen him in a number of years, and he was saying that um, a lot of his colleagues, who are probably in their late 60s, um, no longer practicing. They just have stopped. They've just, after the pandemic and going through it, they were exhausted and they said no more. And what was even more amusing to me is that my husband, who was a retired dentist, um, the gentleman at the front asked him if he was interested in a job. <laughs> That's funny. And I said yes, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said maybe not so not much. Not retiring. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I guess part of the challenge is then uh, for organizations, as I said, is they got to look at things differently now. They got to look at organizational structure differently, working conditions, uh, all of those things. So it requires a certain amount of, of cre creativity, especially because, uh, you know, you have people who have, yeah, you got people who are back in offices, you got people who have hybrid working environments, people who've got remote only, you know, remote only uh, or virtual only. So you can't, you can't just uh, maintain the structures and the way you approach things in the past, because the reality of how people work and how they organize themselves is, is so different. I can't think of anything in business today that is the same as it was. Mm -hmm post, you know, pre-pandemic. I mean, look what's going on with the inability to get, you know, um, merchandise and supplies and the whole mm -hmm. supply chain issue. And, you know, here's the problem. A lot of people have these talent strategies that they may have paid big bucks for that, you know, right now they're not worth the paper they were printed on. So, mm -hmm really have to blow it up. You've got to go in there with a fresh eye and say, if I were starting this company today, or if I were now the CEO of this organization, how would I do things? How would I structure this organization? You know, for example, let's pretend that I don't own this office building <laughs> because I really right. need people to get back here, or I didn't sign a 10 year lease and we're in year three. So, you know, with a fresh eye, what would I do differently? And that's how you're going to create an environment that's going to work for today as well as the future. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great piece of advice. I'd even take it a stage further. We used to do is like if you're going to set up a business to put you out of business, what would it be? <laughs> that that way then it forces you to identify all of your your weaknesses but there's a there's a great point that you made there if i have a if i have a building with a 10 year lease on it i'm naturally motivated to try and drive people into the office even if that is not in the best interests of the employees or to be honest or the productivity of the organization Yes. And we're seeing that, right? I mean, it was funny. I was on LinkedIn and, and this gentleman, I used to work in commercial real estate, so I felt mm. like I could respond. And he made a comment about, he was a, um, a VP of property management for a major um, commercial building, you know, real estate company. And he listed all these reasons why people should come back to the office and how it wasn't productive for them to stay home. And I just like went head on and I just, you know, responded and I said, would you really, you know, say anything differently, given that you are the VP of leasing for mm -hmm. a 
your commercial real estate company. I mean, you know, I think that you can be biased. We all can be biased. Sure. Yeah. And I think an another thing, Robert, I'd love to get your insight on this is another thing that I think when you have talent in your organization, we have an awful tendency to focus on the things that people don't do well, right? As opposed to focusing on the things they do do well, right? So we often go, because uh, I, I always say this about like performance improvement or not performance improvement, but performance reviews when people have them. It's normally, hey, Roberta, here's the one thing that you're, here's a couple of things you're doing really well. Now here's the 54 things that you're not and I want you to work on. But I think we have to get away from that and realize that it's much better focusing on what people are good at and 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 orientating their job more and more towards that than it is focusing on things things they're not good at because it's going to frustrate them and it's going to frustrate you and nobody's going to win. Well, I would agree with you. And you know, part of the problem with these performance reviews is that you know companies have these silly rules like you yeah. can have no more than five percent of the population be a five, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, done an exceptional job of hiring really talented people. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm working with an international um, organization right now, and I just got done doing uh, 360 for an executive coaching assignment I'm doing. I, in my entire life, have never spoken to such bright, intelligent people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking like UN quality here. <laughs> I mean, if you said in this organization, well, not everybody is a high achiever, I would have to push back because I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. And, and I think, the, and, and obviously the other part now is when you are going out and, and recruiting people, I, most people still to this day go, oh, I want to hire a, uh, an email marketing person, right? Let me go on to the internet and find an email marketing job description. Okay, got it. Let me change a couple of things and fire it out. Good, done. And and I just think that that's people. The, number one, jobs are not so defined anymore. Things are so much more kind of fluid. New job. I mean, there's there, there'll be new jobs next year that don't exist this year. So taking that approach to me again, it just seems like it, it's it's very convenient, but it's lazy and counterproductive in the end. Well, what I, what I have said at, again in Evergreen Talent is that we shouldn't have job descriptions. We should have results descriptions. Mm -hmm. So what is the result you hope that I will achieve in this role? That gets me on board, right? And that's a much better way to look at things than to take the job description from your colleague across the street and just change the name and say, okay, here's your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, as I as I normally used to say to people was that uh, the the most important sentence on your job description is and any other tasks your manager might ask you to do. <laughs> or other duties as assigned, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, what are some of the other ways that because as you mentioned earlier, I mean, like there's so there's so much talent out there, and I think this is a a, a, a misconception people have because. It's hard to hire people. There's a lot of vacancies you see around. So it makes it seem like there's not that many talented people out there. But there is. They're just uh, obviously a lot more discerning and probably choosier than they've ever been. And they have more options than they've ever been. Let's face it, uh, you know, with remote work, with hybrid work, all of that, I have so many more options than I once upon a time had. So how do you how do you address that? Well, I think you really have to start by looking again at your organization. I can't tell you how often I get emails uh, from people who have told me I have applied for like 100 jobs, 1,000 jobs. I thought I, I've never heard from the company, right? And so basically, or a company, and that just tells me that, you know, this whole uh, rush to do, you know, with technology and these applicant tracking systems, really what they're doing is they're screening candidates out rather than screening them in. And so, you know, my own daughter's going through a job search right now. I'd like to believe she has an expert by her side helping her, which would be me. Right. <laughs> I just cannot believe the behavior on the other side. You know, you apply for a job, you never hear back from anyone, you get an interview and you're referred in, right? So somebody mm -hmm. there knows you and you never hear back whether or not you've, you know, moving on. Um, it's just crazy. So some of it is, is the systems that are in place. 
Then there are policies in organizations. For example, one of my clients uh, who I've been advocating, I'm like, look, you have to go out there and find your own people. Do not wait right. for HR. Um, she's like, well, it's against our company policy. Like HR has to bring us the candidates. And I'm like, well, what are there three people in HR and a hundred job openings? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've yeah. got to get out of your own way. And that goes back to what we were talking about, which is really re-engineering, re-engineering your processes, making them more efficient. Uh, I just wrote a piece today on um, how to hire an employee in seven days or less. Mm, very good. Uh, if anyone wants a copy of that, uh, I'm sure you'll have my contact information yep. in the Absolutely. show. I'd be happy to provide that for them. <laughs> Absolutely, no, that's fan that's fantastic, and uh, and here's a, here's another one just uh, out of interest as well is like you were just saying there is, you know, the bad the bad behavior or whatever from from the companies from the companies themselves. Um, I'll give you another great example of it. A company I ran a number of years back, the parent company, it uh, controlled HR, uh, and HR had this had this policy about degrees, right? Because I one time found a resume came, I don't know how it got to my desk, but it was a fantastic resume person. I thought, this is great. Called them up and said, are we calling this person in? Said, oh no, they don't have a degree. <laughs> and I was like, what? And they're saying, no, they don't have a degree. That's policy. It's uh, it's uh, you know policy of HR. It's the company policy. And I said, well, what do you mean? Like I said, they left college. I don't know. Like, well, but they didn't go to college. I said, but um, like they have about 25 years of fantastic work experience. Why do I care whether they have a degree or not? I mean, uh, that's just nonsense. But so I think we tie ourselves into these crazy uh, rigid rules, if you like, instead of like looking at things more objectively. You know, it's interesting that you should mention that there was a study done, and I know I don't have the percentages right, but you'll get the gist of it. Um, something like, you know, 40% of production managers in manufacturing, um, if they were to apply for the same job, either in their organization or somewhere else, they could not get hired today. They mm. don't have a college degree. They were promoted from within, but yet here they are doing the job and most cases doing it well. So your point is very well taken. And, you know, I look at these job descriptions and I'm like, I'm not sure why you need a degree to be a receptionist for a skincare center. Yeah. I mean, maybe a law firm, I don't know, but for a skincare center, like that just doesn't make sense to me. And yet you'll go to, you know, a chamber of commerce meeting and you'll be overhearing a conversation of the owner of this spa complaining how, you know, she can't find people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and that's what I'm, that, that, that's, uh, that's the point, I think, is that people are still living in very traditional um, structures and, they, and they've locked themselves into these things that make no sense. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think from books like yours and people like yourself, I mean, people have to take a completely new look at it. And and I think there again is a problem, Roberta. I'm sure you've come across this many times, but let's face it, we don't really want to think about hiring people. It's a headache. It's a hassle. So we don't. So we're not. We don't put the effort into it to re reality because we just want it over and done with. Okay, John. So here's my advice: If you don't really want to go and hire people, then why don't you try and keep the people you have? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's that's an excellent excellent piece of excellent piece of advice, uh, and uh, just in the last couple of moments we have here, what are some of the ways you can you can make sure that you're putting your best foot forward in terms of retaining staff? You have to make sure you have the best managers and leaders in the industry, because people don't work for companies; they work for people. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with you. And I think uh, and I think that's why, as we talked about earlier, with the changes in people's circumstances and all of that, I think it's a fantastic time for 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 managers and leaders to have conversations with um, their employees and get to understand, you know, maybe there is a better setup for you. Maybe this is advantageous to both of us. Maybe we can come to some sort of. But I think opening that dialogue is really important. I agree. And, you know, that's also up to the employee. That's not just yeah. the manager's responsibility. If your listeners are working for somebody and their situation has changed and they really need more of a hybrid situation, they need to approach that conversation and not wait 
Because if you're waiting for your manager to start it, it's probably never going to happen. Yeah, no, that's for sure. That's for sure. We're, we're all very selfish at the end of the day. It's like a video. It's, in a, don't, it's not broken, so don't say anything right now. <laughs> yeah, no. They're, they don't have time because they're so busy. Yeah. Honestly, they're so busy doing their job and doing the jobs of the jobs of the people that aren't in these jobs. They're not thinking about this stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that's the other thing is like nobody cares about your job as much as you do. Nobody cares about your success as much as you do. And that's why in, in part, and that's why I always say to people, don't wait around for your companies to train you or to invest in your development. Like you should be doing that yourself anyway. And hopefully your company will will do it as well. Well, listen, Roberta, this has been fantastic. All of Roberta's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Well, I help organizations attract top talent that will stick around. And that really always comes down to the leadership. And as a result of that, um, I invest a lot of time working with top performers who are good and helping them become great. And um, I do a lot of executive coaching. Um, I've written six books on leadership and talent. And um, I would be honored to hear from your listeners if they've got a question that uh, our conversation today has kind of stirred up in their minds. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage you to go check it out. Go check out Roberta's work. Go check out her books. Um, from the amount of uh, the amount of people who still seem to be unable to hire people, it's obvious people need help. So I would encourage you to go check it out and maybe we'll see some of those help wanted notices coming down soon. Um, listen, Roberta, thanks a lot. Again, thank you for watching and listening. I'll talk to you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.